Sorry to break up the chat and the conversation. I'd just like to welcome you all here to Rosemary Street non-subscribing Presbyterian Church. We're very blessed in the NSPCI with the abundance of history that has shaped our denomination. And we are also blessed this evening because David Steers is going to share with us some uh, one of the uh, ministers of our denomination who played such an interesting and challenging uh, part in the life not only of uh, the church, but of the country as well. So before and after David, uh, our musician in residence, Tanya Houghton, will play for us. And at the conclusion of this uh, book launch, you are all invited to Central Hall for some refreshments. They say that history repeats itself. It has to because nobody's really listening. But let's hope we're all listening this evening as I hand over to Tanya. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be here to play some music tonight to go alongside this talk. Um, I was asked if I could provide some music that would be from the time. And I don't know if there are any music lovers out there, but 1685 was a particularly fantastic year. And I'm sure you will all have heard of uh, the two composers who were born there, Johann Sebastian Bach and George Friedrich Handel. So it was an amazing year for music, and so very easy for me to find some pieces to go alongside uh, our talk today. Um, working at the same time as them was a, another not unknown composer called Antonio Vivaldi. So you have a piece of Bach, a piece of Vivaldi, and a piece of Handel for you tonight. Um, the first thing I, I'm going to play is a Passacaglia by Handel, uh, and then you'll have your talk. After the talk, I'll be playing um, something from Vivaldi's Four Seasons and uh, finishing off with a piece of violin music by Bach, which has been transcribed for the harp. So I hope you enjoy the music contributions as well to your evening. Thank you.
Now I'd like to invite the Right Reverend Michael Barry, the Chair of the Presbyterian Historical Society in Ireland and a former moderator of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland to come and say a few words. Michael. Simon, I want to thank you for your welcome and the opportunity to say a few words. I feel very guilty, I have to say, that I'm speaking and the organ is silent, or that the harp is silent. Um, the only redeeming feature is that you're going to hear it again, so I will be brief. Um, you might be surprised to hear that the Presbyterian Historical Society of Ireland was formed to promote the history of Presbyterianism in Ireland. Uh, it's run by a council which comprises of members of the three main historic Presbyterian traditions, the non-subscribing uh, Presbyterian Church, the Reformed Presbyterian Church and the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. And our work's divided into three main areas. We have an extensive library and archive which is based at assembly buildings in the centre of Belfast under the watchful eye of our librarian and archivist, uh, Valerie Adams. And that is available for people who want to do some research or who just have a general interest in Presbyterian history. And Valerie is always willing to help uh, if you need any guidance. We have a website. Um, believe it or not, it's known as Presbyterian History Ireland. Is this all sort of fallen into place with you? Um, we're on social media and we welcome individuals to join the society on uh, 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 an annual basis or on a, a short term basis or to become life members and along with the um, membership details and the details of the society all of that's on the website. We host a series of talks throughout the year on topics related to Presbyterianism and in fact, the next talk is going to be tomorrow evening when Dr. Bill Adley will speak about the Jungle Tribes Mission and Missionary Elders. It will be held on Zoom. And if you're interested, again, there are details on the website. The lecture following that is going to be held here in Rosemary Street when uh, Dr. John Nelson, um, and you wouldn't ask, it's going to be in person because you wouldn't ask John to speak on a computer. Um, <laughs> And we, we, we had a Zoom meeting today, a council meeting, and John appeared on Zoom, uh, sitting in our front room on my iPad when I was in another room on the laptop. But I pushed the buttons, I positioned him, positioned the camera, and left him to it. And I have to say, he behaved remarkably well, and he looks very well on screen. But he's going to be here in person, and that's going to be in February. He'd be speaking on... Um, preaching to the poor in Belfast, the diary of the Reverend A. McIntyre, 1853 to 56. And then thirdly, we publish material relating to Presbyterian history. And most of our booklets are quite small, uh, easy to read, um, although we have published and reprinted larger works. But talking about publishing books, which is a, an important aspect of our work, um, that's really why we're here this evening. Over the past number of years, uh, Dr. Steers um, has been researching and writing on the work of the Reverend Samuel Halliday. And I'm sure that David needs no introduction to you. As an eminent historian, he's a member of our uh, society's council. And as you read the book, you'll become aware of the meticulous uh, research uh, and extensive research that he has done in preparing his material and he has presented that material in a clear and in an understandable way to give us a great picture of uh, Halliday. I'm not going to steal his thunder um, but to whet your appetite let me quote one line from the book about Halliday. Taken all together Samuel Halliday had a truly remarkable life. We've come this evening for the launch of Dr. Steer's book, and we look forward to hearing something about that remarkable life. 
so on behalf of the uh, Presbyterian Historical Society of Ireland, um, it's a great pleasure to be associated uh, with David's work and to be here this evening um, to be able to speak to you about the Society and to support him in the launch of this booklet. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, and uh, thank you for your kind words, and thank you for being here this evening. It, it's, it's a great privilege to have you here with us to bring the, the blessing of the Society, and uh, it is the Society's book that's being launched, and I, I'm grateful to the Presbyterian Historical Society for being willing to publish um, and, uh, this, this work and to wait quite a long time for it, but it's out tonight and available today. And a big thank you to everyone at Rosemary Street for uh, making this evening happen. That's, uh, it's been great, and everyone who's helped in any way. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. And a big, big thank you to Tanya for playing tonight. It's fantastic uh, to hear that music, contemporary to Samuel Halliday music, which I have no doubt he knew and enjoyed. So uh, the book's available, and uh, you can pick it. only three pounds if you want one. Um, I don't propose to, I'll try not to repeat what's in the book uh, tonight. Uh, I'm going to try and literally illustrate the book uh, with some images and also try and set Samuel Halliday in his context because an um, important thing about him was he was the minister of this congregation. Now he wasn't here, this building wasn't built until 1783, so it's much, much later. Uh, but he was minister of this congregation and to some extent, he's a missing link in the history, which is surprising. Um, but when the centenary history was published in 1883, he's talked about, particularly in the, context, in the context of the controversy over subscription, and when Tom Moore wrote his excellent history about 100 years later, he's mentioned, but there's not a full focus on him. And uh, it's, a, it's a bit strange, uh, and I wonder why, why that, that was. Uh, also, in the vestry in the church here, there are pictures of every minister going back uh, to, 17, uh, to 1695, which is a pretty good stretch of history to cover, except for Halliday. There's no portrait of Halliday in the church. So that's one of the reasons I started with this picture of him here. And this, this is a photograph that I took of a photograph that the Presbyterian Historical Society owns and it seems to have belonged to a Colonel Gordon who lived at uh, Delamont near, near Killilay but I don't think anyone knows where the original oil painting is but there is this, this quite impressive black and white photograph so that is Samuel Halliday as he appeared uh, at the prime of life uh, and everyone will see or almost everyone will see in the slides is like him literally a big wig uh, in those days, particularly ministers, Presbyterian ministers, uh, dressed like that. And it's, um, it's an interesting comment on the way uh, uh, society changes. But that, that, that's the classic dress for a man like him in his age. So I entitled this Licensed in Rotterdam, Ordained in Geneva, Installed in Belfast. Samuel Halliday and Religious Controversy Amongst Presbyterians in Belfast and Beyond in the Early 18th Century. So Halliday is really the, the person around whose head the subscription controversy breaks in Belfast, uh, in Ulster. But by the time he gets here, he's had a rather more varied career than most Presbyterian ministers had then or now. And one of the opportunities I've had is of uncovering some of that history, which for some reason uh, has been lost. And one of the reasons of writing that book, which began life as a lecture to the Presbyterian Historical Society, is to put in the record some of this material which had been lost or forgotten about, overlooked uh, over the centuries. So, James Duckle was really his biographer. 
And he described him as a gentleman of genteel education and polite manners, a fine scholar and of a generous spirit. And I think that this is true. This, this is the kind of character he had. Uh, he was highly regarded by everyone he met. He moved uh, very smoothly between all sort of strata of society and particularly uh, was well known uh, at the, the top ends of society. Uh, but his, his origins were very humble. His father was a minister uh, and he was born in Omer. And you can read in the book uh, the, the situation regarding his father's uh, stipend. It was considerably in arrears when he died. They, they must have been really on the poverty line. Yet somehow or other, uh, Halliday uh, was, was very well educated at home and then very well educated abroad. So you can see one of the phrases that Duckel uses is that he received a liberal education in the schools in this country, uh, which is a tantalizing phrase, and it could mean a lot of different things. It possibly means he was educated at the Killalay Academy or the Killalay Philosophy School, which is a very important institution that was providing university level education uh, for aspiring candidates for the Presbyterian ministry. There's not a trace of it left now. We know very little about, about the curriculum, about who was there. Uh, we know some names of some students. Probably he was there. Uh, it, he certainly had enough of an education uh, in Ulster uh, to go straight into the top class uh, at Glasgow University. Now, the top class meant he had already completed the first three years of a degree uh, somewhere uh, in the north of Ireland. Uh, possibly he was educated by his father, who was a, a considerable figure and may have been involved in tutoring uh, young boys, particularly for the ministry. Um, his father was also a patron of an academy in Whitehaven, which is, is very little known. Um, but it seems there was an academy in Whitehaven which was used by Ulster Presbyterians or, or, or was prepared to be used by Ulster Presbyterians uh, as a training uh, ground when things got tight, which they, which they often did at this time. Either way, we know he went to Glasgow, and this is the University of Glasgow at about that time in 1708. So he, this, this, is a, this is a very traditional route for uh, Presbyterian ministers or students for the ministry uh, from, from the north of Ireland. Uh, they, they were required to have a degree. The Trinity College Dublin was close to them, Oxford and Cambridge were close to them. So the only place they could go was to the Scottish universities. Of course, they were very closely tied to Scotland by culture and background anyway. And Glasgow was the closest of the universities. And almost everyone we talk about, or I'll talk about uh, in this film show, uh, every minister was educated uh, at Glasgow. Uh, and sometimes it's suggested that Glasgow University was the source of the kind of radicalism that emerges amongst the non-subscribers. But I think, uh, in actual fact, what, what was happening was uh, students from here were taking their own sense of um, being, having their rights curtailed, which they did uh, at that point uh, in Ulster. They, they, took, they took that sense of being, uh, not being full citizens to Glasgow, they reflected upon it there, and they came back with a stronger radicalism, uh, which, which was sort of imbued by being there. It wasn't necessarily uh, a, a, a tradition of teaching radicalism. In some ways, it was quite conservative. Uh, Sandy Stewart says, the movement of ideas is as much a movement from Ireland to Scotland and its roots lie in the civil disabilities of the Irish dissenters. So, he arrives and matriculates in Glasgow in 1701. He graduates in, probably in 1702. The records are lost, so we don't know for sure. And then he's installed in Belfast in 1720. So there's an 18-year gap between completing his studies and 
and start or completing his initial studies and starting in Belfast. And that's really what I'm going to look at mostly uh, tonight, because that's the area where a whole lot of new material has come to light, which fills out his life and tells us a lot about him and a lot about the times he lived in. So this is the uh, McClanachan's map of uh, Belfast in 1715, just, just to give the context of where he comes. So this, this, is, this is Rosemary Street or Rosemary Lane as it was then. And this, this is the first church here, not this building, its predecessor. And this is the second congregation here because uh, for a couple of hundred years, uh, the first and the second church uh, were both on this site. First church here, second church behind. Later, when a uh, third church emerged, that was built a little bit further up the road, somewhere about here, where the Masonic Hall is now. So there were three Presbyterian churches uh, on, on Rosemary Street. And um, John McBride, Halliday's predecessor, was able to secure this site uh, from the Earl of Donegal. And you can see that this is a sort of uh, uh, attempt to... Uh, to, to draw, to, this, is the, this is the only likeness we have of the building, but it's a, an attempt to draw it as it appeared. So it was probably quite a large T-shaped meeting house uh, with, with, two, with, with, with galleries uh, inside it. Uh, the second congregation was probably cruciform. So the, so the first church was probably something like Downpatrick, if you know Downpatrick, an unsubscribing church. And the, the, the second congregation, original building, was probably something like Kalinchi Presbyterian Church, which is cruciform. Uh, but that, that's the way they built the churches in those days. So, so this is the, the context of where Halliday comes to be installed just a few years later in 1720. And there's a, there's a description in the, the centenary volume says, Here we are in Rosemary Street by help of our good McBride, on this pleasant spot of ground he planted us when it was open field, abutting upon a crooked lane with the scent of rosemary still about it. Here on the green sward of the meadow, an oblong structure arose. So there's the building. And here are some of his uh, colleagues, again, just to try and give some context for him. So in the middle is John Abernethy. John Abernethy most closely associated with the development of non-subscription uh, in, uh, in the Synod of Ulster. I won't say too much about him now, but on the left and on the right here uh, are, are his two, uh, well, his, his immediate colleague here on the left is James Kirkpatrick. Kirkpatrick was called to be the minister of the second congregation uh, in 1706. And we saw the map there with the, with the two churches close together in the centre of the town. By, by that time, by about uh, 1706, the first congregation, the original Presbyterian congregation, included about 3,000 people. Uh, the majority of the population in Belfast were Presbyterians, but they didn't have anything like full uh, civil rights. So there was this large burgeoning population uh, eager to, to express themselves through business and so on, and also aware that they, that they, were, they were denied uh, full civil rights. But they, they called Kirkpatrick, uh, I think he was called in 1706, with the intention of founding a new congregation. So this first congregation divided in two like an amoeba and uh, built the, the second church uh, behind it, and Kirkpatrick uh, came, came to be the colleague uh, to this man here, who is John McBride. Now, Kirkpatrick, uh, again, with Abernethy, and in fact with McBride, all educated in Glasgow. And Kirkpatrick uh, was a considerable scholar. He has the distinction of being one of the few people to receive uh, the Doctorate of Divinity and a medical doctorate on the same day from the same university, again from Glasgow. He practiced as a doctor throughout his period uh, as a minister. But Kirkpatrick comes to, to take over the, the new congregation founded behind this one, and uh, McBride is the minister here at the same time. This, this is the portrait that hangs up, up in the vestry there. And McBride is an interesting character because 
Uh, he's much older than these other chaps. He's born about 1650. And he, um, uh, he had a very, uh, a, a very dry sense of humor, among other things, um, because everyone, uh, I'm sure everyone in First Church knows that he was famous for being a non-juror or a non-abjurer. He refused to take the, the uh, oath of abjuration, uh, which would have um, uh, abjured the, um, uh, the, right, the, the, um, the legitimacy of the old pretender's claim to the throne. For very personal reasons, uh, he, he, he wouldn't take the oath. And this made him uh, a criminal. He had to spend a lot of time uh, out uh, of Ulster because they were determined to arrest him. And when the congregation actually split into uh, Kirkpatrick and the others were writing to him in Scotland uh, where he was hiding. Now again, a very capable man, uh, a very scholarly man. Uh, McBride was offered the, the role of uh, professor of divinity at Glasgow, but didn't take it. And one of the other things he did, he taught divinity to students uh, for the ministry here as well, which, which was a feature of some, some of the more senior ministers' activity. Uh, but of course, when, when McBride was a non-abjurer, the sovereign of Belfast came to arrest him. He'd already flown to Glasgow, and uh, the sovereign went into his uh, manse, which was next door, and, and, and stuck his sword, it said, in, into his portrait just there, you can see the mark, and said, I'll get you next time, something like that. But he didn't because McBride managed to stay uh, one step ahead. One of the best stories about McBride is when, <clears throat> on another occasion, the sovereign of Belfast, who was like the mayor, came to attend morning worship. And he'd been, the sovereign had been playing cards until late the night before. And he came and sat in the gallery with his cards still in his pocket. And when they had to stand up to sing a psalm, uh, his cards fell out of his pocket and cascaded down uh, into the pews below. And McBride said, hey, sir, but your psalm book is badly bound. And <laughs> So uh, th there's, there, there's some of his... his, his McBride dies in, in 1718, so uh, Halliday succeeds him. Oh, sorry. Right, so... <clears throat> we, left, we left Halliday leaving or graduating in Glasgow uh, with, with an MA uh, in 1702. Now, Duckle says... By some favourable events in Providence, Halliday was placed in a station in which he had opportunity of seeing the most remarkable places in Europe. So again, uh, Duckle knew what happened and what he did, but he doesn't really explain how this came about. Uh, but certainly, Halliday would have spent another three or four years in Glasgow studying divinity. This was the normal process for someone training for the ministry. They'd, they'd take a degree and then he'd have to, they'd have to study divinity. Now they might do this in Belfast. As I've mentioned, John McBride uh, taught divinity to students. They might do it in Dublin uh, where Joseph Boyce uh, taught divinity. Or they might do it in Glasgow or Edinburgh or, or even Aberdeen or St. Andrews. But in, in Halliday's case, he stayed in uh, Glasgow a little bit longer and then you might have expected him to come back, but he doesn't. He goes on, first of all, to the University of Leiden. Now, this was a university in the Netherlands with some strong connections with, uh, with Ireland and Scotland and England. And uh, there were a couple of thousand students went there in a hundred year period from, from these islands. Uh, but still, he goes there and he, he matriculates and graduates submitting two theses in July 1706. And we, we can sort of plot his life in Leiden because the, 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 the Presbytery of Antrim Library, which is now in Queens, has books that belong to him and belong to his father. And we can see some of them, when he purchased them, how much he purchased them uh, for in Leiden, and he, he purchases, for instance, a, a Hebrew uh, concordance and within a year is submitting a thesis based uh, on reading the Old Testament in Hebrew. Now, it may be that he learned Hebrew in a year. 
It may be he did a bit in Glasgow, but he was certainly, he was very smart. Now still, he doesn't come back. He goes on to the University of Basel. And again, this isn't just a sort of holiday visit. This is serious academic study. He matriculates at Basel and remains there for a full academic year. But still, he doesn't come home. He goes off on a, a journey across Europe, visiting many different universities and ending up in Geneva. Now, Geneva is, is a, a key destination for him. And uh, in Geneva, he is uh, ordained. Now, he's licensed in Rotterdam, which comes, uh, I think, uh, uh, at the time of um, he finishes in Leiden. He's licensed, and he signs the Westminster Confession at that time. And it is the Westminster Confession, even though he's in the Netherlands, he does sign the Westminster Confession when he's licensed. But by the time he gets to Geneva, he chooses to be ordained there because subscription is not required in Geneva. And Geneva really is, of course, the, the, the home of the Reformation. It's, it's the home of Calvin. It's the, very, it's the place we identify most of all with the kind of uh, the theology of John Calvin. But by this time, Geneva has changed a lot. So, in 1706, they abandon uh, subscription in Geneva, under the leadership of a fellow called John Alphonse uh, Turatini. And uh, as, as it says there, uh, he, in his own words, he accepts ordination amongst the community of pastors in Geneva because the terms of church communion there are not narrowed by any human impositions. So it's a reminder of what we think of as, as an Irish controversy over subscription uh, isn't just a local controversy. It's something that's sweeping across Europe. It's something that has been discussed and debated in Geneva, and it's, it's something that has been um, dealt with and, and resulted in an abandonment uh, of subscription. So he arrives there in 1708, just after all this, or 1707, and he's ordained in 1708. And it, it marks the start of a lifelong connection with the city of Geneva. There's a, lot of th there's a few things he did write. You can read uh, the high praise he gives uh, to, to the city. Uh, in later life, he prepares this paper, uh, De Republica Ecclesia et Academia Genovensi, um, which he, he gave and he intended to have published, but unfortunately that's something that hasn't been found. So he, um, he comes in contact with Geneva, and this is what changes him. Uh, in 1827, uh, William Bruce talked about uh, him coming back to Rotterdam from Geneva, a, a totally changed person. And there may be some truth in that, but certainly Geneva is, is the key point uh, in his life. So let's just take a step back, because I've mentioned the, the, the centenary history uh, of this church and th there is as Simon said at the start a lot of history in this denomination and I hope it is a, a blessing and, and not a heavy weight I think it is something we, we we're obliged to encounter we're obliged to try and understand and try and make sense of and there have been a lot of people uh, over the years who've been very interested uh, in the history of this denomination of Presbyterianism of religious history in Ireland and this is one, this is Alexander Gordon. Now Gordon was, uh, all those things I've listed uh, on the left there, this is Gordon about the time he was minister of this church. There's a memorial to Alexander Gordon over there. And he, he was minister here. Uh, at the same time as being minister, at that time he was a lecturer uh, for the denomination. I think he was professor of church history for the denomination. He was also a historian of, of really no mean ability. I've just written there that he contributed 778 biographies uh, to the Dictionary of National Biography. That's just one of the things he did. Now, that's a lot of writing. It's a lot of research. It's a lot of traveling, a lot of visiting different um, libraries and archives. He was a tremendously able uh, historian. This is him when he was young. This is him in about the last week of his life going to Dunmurry, 
uh, to preach there. He, he was a member of Dunmurray in old age and he's buried in Dunmurray and you can recognise the wall there. I don't know who the dapper gentleman here is in the spats, but uh, I remember the congregation, but there he is going into Dunmurray. So, so Gordon um, was, a, was, a, was a really first-class historian from long ago, but a really significant historian. And if Alexander Gordon said something happened on the 3rd of September 1721, well, you can be sure it did happen on the 3rd of September 1721. He was meticulous in his research. And there's really no one like him from that period. Not just non-subscribers, but subscribers, Methodists, Muggletonians, uh, all sorts of uh, different people. He, he wrote about people in, in Ireland and England and Scotland and in Poland and in Hungary. And all, he was multilingual. He, he was very, very talented. But my involvement with Samuel Halliday came when this book, The Dictionary of National Biography, was uh, republished or rewritten uh, the early part of this century. Um, it was over 100 years old. The Oxford University Press decided to bring out a new edition. So I was asked, among other things, to, to go over the entry that Gordon had written on Samuel Halliday. Now, I, I assumed, and mostly this is a, an assumption that um, is going to be correct, that whatever Gordon said and did uh, in the 1890s uh, could not be improved upon because it's very unlikely that any, any texts or any documents that Gordon couldn't find then uh, won't, won't have come to light in the, in the ensuing 100 years. So I didn't expect to find anything new. I expected just to change the, the language and to change a few little details here and there. But the more I looked at Halliday, the more I've been able to find more things about him. Now, one of the things is this. Now, there, there, are about, there are three documents relating to Presbyterian history, particularly with regard to non-subscribers, which have taken on almost mythical status. One is some letters written by Henry Winder, uh, who was a minister in Liverpool, but who attended all the debates of the various synods in the run-up through the non-subscribing controversy. Now, they were published in 1826 and then subsequently lost. And Alexander Gordon said, I saw them in the cupboard in 1867 and I went back in 1880 and they were gone. Uh, now, they were published, so we do know what they said, but they're, they're, they're important, but they're lost. Another thing that's lost are the six volumes of uh, John Abernethy's diary. Abernethy um, started to keep a spiritual diary in the Puritan fashion about 1713, and he filled six volumes with his writings. And they were read by, um, by James Duckle, who I've already mentioned, and uh, then presumably lost. However, um, the person who wrote the DNB entry on on John Abernethy, claimed to have seen these diaries in the 1890s. Now, he was probably lying or joking, however you want to put it. He probably didn't, but he claims to have seen them. But having said that, other people have said to me, they've seen the diaries. They're kept in a secret place. Somebody has them. Someone's hidden them away. So there is this kind of life uh, to these long-forgotten, long-lost diaries where people will tell you that they're hidden away in one place or another. But the third thing that was lost and thought lost forever was this book. This is the Album Amicorum of Samuel Halliday. Now, it is basically a glorified uh, autograph book, but it's, it's, it's much more than that. An Album Amicorum is a, um, a recognised type of literature, particularly on the continent. And students in the 18th century would have got a book like this, and as they travelled around, they, they would get their professors to, to fill it in. Now, William, William Bruce, whose memorial is just behind me here, he saw this book in, in about 1826, and he couldn't really make out what it was, and people thought maybe these were his testimonials that were sent to the Synod when he was accepted uh, into the ministry. But no, it was this, this album Amicorum. And um, no one, no one had seen it since 1826. 
But the day I gave, um, I gave this lecture on Samuel Halliday, I put Halliday's name into Google in Latin, Samuel Hallidayus. And much to my astonishment, it took me straight to the University of Leiden, where this book was kept in special collections. So it wasn't really lost because it was in the university library. But no one, no one seemed to be aware of that. No one ever referred to it. No one had ever used it in any way. No one had seen it or thought about it uh, in the time it had been there and it arrived there in the early 70s. So by chance, I was due to go to Leiden and, uh, for, for a conference. And with my friend, the late Professor Stewart, we photographed every page in, in Halliday's uh, album and Corum. There's a sort of ornamental delight, uh, ornamental design at the start. And this is a crucial book because it illustrates very clearly his movements across Europe over a two-year period. And it also illustrates very clearly his relationship with all the different um, professors and senior pastors across Europe that he knew. Um, i just read this. The, the, the album relates very definitely to his period as a student. The last entry is by Thomas Hoog, minister of the Scots Kirk in Rotterdam, who notes his travels around Europe and his return to Flanders to join the British camps. should say also in 1708, he doesn't return as a minister, but becomes a chaplain uh, in, 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 in regiments in the army. In the time covered, Halliday matriculated at two universities, uh, but visited more were able to date and track his travels through the album and these tie in with other evidence so that we can date his peregrinations very precisely. The album consists of 97 signatures by people he encountered, some of them students, some professors, some churchmen, a few lay people and members of the nobility. Every inscription includes some dedication and often some sort of motto or quotation. These might come from the Bible, from the church fathers, or some other source, whether classical or later. But they might be written in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, or Arabic. The vast majority of dedications are written in Latin, although a few are in French or Italian. And it also shows uh, the route of his travels, where he went from Utrecht to Leiden, to Heidelberg, to Basel, to Zurich, to Bern, to Neuchâtel, to Lausanne, to Geneva, back to Neuchâtel, and then back to Rotterdam. Now, it's a remarkable achievement to spend two years traveling around Europe, two years visiting the leading universities, two years making the acquaintance of the leading personalities uh, in the study of theology, and also making an incredibly positive impression on them all. And how that was funded, I have no idea. But that's what he did. And you can see some of the pages here. So this is, this is the page uh, written by uh, Hermann Witsius, who was a uh, professor... Uh, of divinity in Leiden and he, he actually says there that he was almost like a son to him. So one, one of the features of these, these comments that are put in the album Amicorum is they're put in at the end of his stay in whichever university or whichever town it is. So he was in Leiden as we know for a full academic year. Just before he leaves he asks the professors all to fill in this book and that they, they write in such glowing terms about him, such warm terms. They obviously have a very high regard for him. And also gives some indication of the kind of theological background that he's, he's now encountering. Uh, Fitzius says at the top there in Latin, uh, in things necessary unity, um, in things not necessary liberty, uh, in, all, in all things uh, for prudence and charity. So, so that he's encountering a kind of approach to theology that is open, which in, in modern terms we'd probably say is ecumenical. They're trying to diminish the differences between different churches. And, and, and this, is, this is part of the starting point for what he brings back as non-subscription. That's Vitius. This one is Johannes and Mark who was another of the, um, the, the professors at Leiden and who was um, uh, the person before he... Well, both Vitius and a Mark were the people before he had to deliver his theses in Leiden. Well, there are 97 of these, and they, this, this would merit a book in itself, really. 
And this one, this is from Johannes, uh, from uh, Jean Alphonsus Turatini, who was, uh, as I say, the leader of the non subscribers in uh, Geneva. His father was called Francois, and he had introduced, or he'd been uh, closely involved in the introduction of the, the document that has the equivalent place to the Westminster Confession uh, called the Formula Consensus. By this time, a lot of debate has come up, and for the kind of reasons I've mentioned about, about trying to reduce the difference between different churches, about trying to be tolerant to different points of view, they had, under his leadership, discarded subscription uh, in Geneva. And, and this, 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 this is the man, Jean-Alphonse Turatini. Um, let me say a little bit there about, about what he was doing and, and what he was thinking. Uh, this is a book of his that was reprinted uh, in England in 1720. And it also shows that although, although Halliday is a dissenter, he's a Presbyterian, and he's very much involved in the fight for Presbyterian rights, he also moves very smoothly between denominations across Europe and back in England and Ireland. Um, people like Turatini and Vitius and so on were held in very high regard by the leadership of the Church of England and the Church of Ireland. And people like Turatini were able to give uh, Halliday letters of introduction to the bishops and archbishops. You can see this, this book uh, is dedicated to the Archbishop Canterbury, uh, William Wake. But because, because he was so highly regarded in Europe, when he came back to England and to Ireland, he was able to move in the circles, the highest circles of bishops and, um, and archbishops and so on. So I, I, I almost forgot to mention he was also an army chaplain and, 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 and spent the time following Marlborough's army around. But he, um, he, he did have the opportunity, as, as Duffel said, of visiting most parts of Europe. So he's over there studying, he's over there as an army chaplain. A little bit later, uh, there, there, there's, there's the chaplaincy there. Uh, he, he's a chaplain of Colonel George Preston's Cameronian Regiment. Now, this is the only regiment in the British Army that has a religious foundation founded by the Scottish Covenanters. And yet Halliday turns up as a chaplain to them. One of the historians of that regiment says this, that when he was made chaplain, this was evidence that the whole thing had gone to the dogs because he, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't a Covenanter. But he got the job because of this man, William Carstairs, who was the most prominent minister in the Church of Scotland. He was moderator four times. He was principal of the University of Edinburgh. Um, again, he's able to impress him, he, he, he's able to uh, be introduced to him because of his European connections, and Carstairs uh, is instrumental in getting him a job with, with, with the regiment. When he comes out of the regiment, he, um, he comes to London, where he acts as a court lobbyist. He's trying to lobby uh, the powers that be to get them to... Uh, to rein in the, the, the laws they're bringing in against, Pres against Presbyterians, against the centres. He's trying to stop a thing called the Schism Act being applied to Ireland, which would have closed all the Presbyterian schools. But he's trusted uh, to do this at the highest levels. He also liaises very closely with the English dissenters, and this is Edmund Callamy, one of the leading uh, English dissenters in London, who again uh, comes to his rescue uh, when he's needed a little bit later on. But he isn't finished with his European travels. In 1715, he's appointed tutor to William Sloane, who is the nephew of Sir Hans Sloane, who was born in Killalay, founds the British Museum. And uh, Sir Hans Sloane gets him to accompany his nephew on a tour uh, of, of Europe. So again, he's got two years traveling across Europe. And um, he's, he, he's given various things to do. He has to, he has to tutor his young charge and, and look after him. But he also has to collect books. So uh, these are some of the things he did. Uh, th there's, there's the route they took, Paris, Orléans. 
Geneva, Turin, Leghorn, which is Livorno, uh, Naples, Rome, Venice, Geneva, Hanover, Osnabrück. So it's, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty impressive uh, opportunity. And we know how this was funded. It was paid for by, by Sir Hans Sloan. But he collected books and sent them back. And he, he collected information and examined all sorts of different things. So he sends back this report about um, a farmer uh, who, who has a secret way of getting between 20 and 60 stalks out of a single grain of corn. Uh, so I, I, asked, I asked some farmers in Belize if that was possible. And they said there, are, there actually are experiments today in New Zealand uh, where instead of getting three or four stalks out of a single grain, you can get about 30. But the secret is uh, apparently uh, planting them individually, which is, is not that easy. But it was, it, his reports, his letters back to Hans Sloan uh, tell us all about uh, what he did and what he looked at, what he was finding out for Sir Hans Sloan. So this takes us to 1718. He's, uh, 1719, he's in London at this time, back from the tour. He's moving amongst the dissenting circles there. And what happens in London amongst the dissenters is the same that happens in Ireland in the next year. There's a debate over subscription. But he is, he's, he's watched very closely in London by another visitor from Ireland, the Reverend Samuel Dunlop, uh, who decides that he's consorting too closely with those who profess Arianism, those who uh, don't hold to the doctrine of the Trinity, but uh, would see uh, Christ as, as a, a, a creature uh, created by God, but not fully God. Now, uh, Samuel Dunlop reports back to the Synod because it's now clear that Halliday is moving towards accepting a pulpit uh, in Ireland and accuses him of throwing his lot with the Arians. But again, um, Halliday gets the backing of the leading London ministers, both subscribing and non-subscribing. And they all write to the Synod and say, oh, there's nothing wrong with him. He's great. And uh, he, he gets out of this uh, again. So once again, Halliday is able to use his contacts uh, to, uh, to really smooth his way through society, smooth his way through any kind of uh, difficult situations. And uh, Samuel Dunlop is rebuked for his rash and imprudent behavior. But he gets back to Belfast in time for the subscription debates here. The, 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 the stone here is from the former uh, meeting house in Balamoney, but this, this, uh, this phrase, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind, becomes uh, one, of the, um, uh, one, one of the phrases uh, taken by the, by the non-subscribers, by John Abernethy, uh, to, to, to express uh, their approach to scripture and also their approach to the use of creeds and confessions, which in an Irish context is the Westminster Confession. Now, we go back a bit here, we can talk about the Belfast Society being founded in 1705, so people like Kirkpatrick, and Abernethy, who we met before, they were involved in this society where ministers met to, to read the Bible and to, to read and discuss the Bible and to read new books and to, and to, and to debate them and to debate new ideas. Uh, and, and people say, oh, well, this is, how, this is how ideas came in that were disruptive. But it, it wasn't the case at all. This, when they did that, they were following a pattern that had been established for them in Glasgow University. This is what the, the students were encouraged to do there. And they merely brought that back home when they became uh, ministers. And what, uh, what really happens is that the, uh, the subscription controversy is not over theology. It's not over points of uh, specific belief. It's really over authority. Because there, there are a lot of questions about the, the rights of um, of Presbyterians and they're struggling to maintain their rights. Uh, they're also struggling to maintain their right to be dissenters against an established church. But what happens in the established church in England? Uh, in 1717, Bishop Benjamin Hoadley preaches before the king, no less a person than the king, on the text, my kingdom is not of this world. 
So he, 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 he tells the king that uh, he doesn't have the right uh, to impose his views or to impose a system. Uh, it's up to, to people to read the Bible for themselves, basically. And apparently uh, the king at the time thought this was, was a great idea. So, so the, 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 even within the Church of England, there is something approximating to subs a subscription controversy. And in a way, that comes straight back uh, to Ireland when John Abernethy preaches his sermon, Religious Obedience Founded on Personal Persuasion, when he uses that uh, quote from the Book of Romans. So, Halliday is called, um, is called to this congregation. And uh, this is a time when, when Presbyterians really are trying to find a compromise. And they introduce in the Synod a thing called the Pacific Act, which allows people to, or allows ministers to subscribe, but in their own words, and to explain any scruples they have, which can be, then be dealt with by the presbytery. And this is actually really quite, quite an enlightened form of compromise. But Halliday uh, doesn't go along with it. He, he wasn't, he, he didn't have to subscribe when he was in Geneva, and he won't subscribe now. And there, there are, he says a lot of things which are suggestive that he's, he's not looking to um, overturn belief, but he is rejecting the imposition of a creed. And, and there are a number of quotations like this. Uh, so a, you can imagine, it was the talk of the town, July 1720, the presbytery comes here to uh, install him, and there is a protest, and four ministers walk out. But James Kirkpatrick, who uh, we met before, he makes, he's the moderator and he makes sure that the, um, the installation goes ahead. So the immediate, the immediate um, result in Belfast is uh, a number of subscribers leave. Uh, the first congregation, possibly the second congregation do, and form the third congregation on Rosemary Street. Pamphlet war breaks out between the subscribers and the non-subscribers, and eventually it results in the removal of the non-subscribers into the Presbytery of Antrim in 1725. So that's how, uh, that's how the um, subscription controversy uh, plays out. And that, that's the way most of it is explained, uh, or most of Halliday's life is explained around this. But as we've seen, he did a rather good lot before that. But he's one of the main writers in, in this controversy, and these are some of the books uh, he produces. He certainly helps uh, write the fourth one, but he, he's, one of the, he's one of the main exponents of, of non-subscription uh, at this time. So uh, there's a lot of information come out that tells us about his early life. There's his album Amicorum, there's letters which have come to light in Dublin and in Edinburgh and in Glasgow and in, and in London and in Geneva as well. So we can put together a, a whole lot more about, about the world he lived in prior uh, to 1720. After 1720, he's, he's really embroiled in this quarrel, but he also continues as minister of this congregation, as minister of the first congregation in Belfast. And yet, if you look in the histories, we know almost nothing about how uh, the day-to-day -day life of his ministry continued. That would be really, that's the next task, is to find out more about this period after 1720. Uh, it would be very interesting to know uh, exactly what was going on there. But he's here until his death. Um, he died um, in 1739. 1736, his successor, his assistant successor, Thomas Drennan up here, is appointed, so his health is probably... Uh, starting to give out then. He's not very old when he dies, um, but he, um, uh, he, must have had a, he must have had an interesting and fulfilling ministry. They have two sons, uh, Robert, who um, goes to South Carolina and is a uh, customs and excise man and is a bit of a black sheep, and Dr. Alexander Halliday, who becomes a very important doctor uh, in Belfast. I sent a copy of the book to a friend of mine uh, in the United States, and she said to me, she said, David, where are the women in this story? <laughs> well, there, there aren't really any, <laughs> except for his wife, and, and even she is only referred to as 
he marries the widow of Arthur Maxwell. And then, of course, when he dies, she becomes the widow of Samuel Halliday. But, but he married someone who was extremely well-to-do. She, she inherited a lot of money from her first husband. And when he died, uh, they were a very wealthy family by that point. But I think that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's really it. Uh, it's a sort of uh, a bit of a run through and uh, uh, as I say I've tried not to just repeat what's in the book but if you, if you read the book my ga garbled uh, story might make a bit more sense but this is, and I'm pleased to bring his, his portrait here uh, this is the story uh, of the Reverend Samuel Halliday Minister of the First Presbyterian Congregation from 1720 to 1739 Thank you Um, if, maybe if, if there's a couple of minutes, anyone has any questions? Yeah, Raymond. I I I don't I don't have any numbers, and um, it would depend on the availability at that time from baptismal registers and being able to compare them between the three congregations. Uh, I think there, there are a lot of Presbyterians in the town and there's probably enough, there's enough for three churches anyway, I think. Uh, but there, there is this, as you say, this very unseemly fight over money and they both go to Scotland uh, to, well, the subscribers go to Scotland to raise money and the non-subscribers go to Scotland to try and stop them raising money. But... Uh, but it, they're not successful, and they do build a third. I don't. I don't have any any numbers. No. Yeah. That that that's right. And we have a former minister of that church in here tonight. Um, yeah. I'm sure there's any, 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 everyone's exhausted of listening to me. No, he, he's an interesting character. Uh, and uh, he is something like, I think, a missing link in the story of this church, um, which is, is very surprising because he was very important. But he, he doesn't get the attention that he might have gotten any of the histories. And a lot, a lot of that early part of his life just was lost until recently. So it's interesting to uncover it. Yeah, Lena? No, no, this is what it says in the newsletter. Uh, and uh, I think at the time there were various reasons for that. Uh, one is it, it was necessary for dissenters to be buried in the Church, Church of Ireland cemetery because there, were, there was nowhere else. Uh, and they had a right to be buried there, though sometimes that was disputed. Uh, but by going at night, I think it avoided any confrontation with the, uh, the ministers. Also, there was a tendency in the early 18th century uh, certainly in England, and I think here as well, uh, to, to hold burials at night because they were private and they gave the families a chance to, to concentrate on their own sense of bereavement. Um, you know, they weren't, they weren't big funerals. They were just burials. There would have been a funeral sermon. There was a funeral sermon preached here, but it was a private family occasion, which, which you know, in our terms, we say they're focusing on grief kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, the um, there's big, there's there's gaps in the newsletter in the 18th century, isn't there? I think we're fortunate that the sort of period when Halliday died, uh, we can follow when he died. And when the funeral was, when the funeral sermon was preached, and when the burial was, so we know those quite precisely. If it wasn't for the newsletter, we, no one would know anything. I think. James, yeah. Newsletter's connection of the joint families' connection with this congregation is much later. 
Yes. And the doctor bus, because we have then enjoy to become a member here. Uh, in the holidays time, there's a newsletter coming to existence, the family worker congregation doctors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks, John. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, the, it would be quite common for students to go to Glasgow, take a degree, and then spend another three years studying divinity. And it was a separate... They didn't get a degree or anything like this, but they would spend years studying divinity there. And they had to study divinity before they could be ordained uh, and would be, would, would be put on trials at the end to see that they'd, they'd learned what they're supposed to learn. But they could do that elsewhere. They, they didn't have to do that in Scotland. They could do that at home. Some of them, like, like McBride, would have tutored people for divinity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a mystery. I mean, I mentioned in the book the, the situation with his father's stipend, which was seriously in arrears at the time of his death. So, you know, the, it, it's just very hard to see uh, and um, at the start um, let me get back to it uh, Duckle has this sort of tantalising phrase is it uh, I missed it By some favourable event in Providence, Halliday was placed in a station in which he had the opportunity of seeing the most remarkable places in Europe. Well, you know, what that means, I don't know, but, but obviously something happened. He had some, some experience that enabled him to do this because, I mean, this, this is an undertaking that you would expect to be, you know, available only to someone of the sort of noble class. He had to be, he was certainly a very, very able scholar but the money required to do something like that uh, is something else. We know, we know sort of how much his trip uh, around Europe with Sir Hans Sloan cost because he had to account for that and he would have written back to Sir Hans Sloan and say, uh, he was always very careful to sort of blame it on the nephew. So your nephew would like to stay in Paris a little bit longer. Uh, obviously I can't intervene. Uh, but it will help him with his French if we stay in Paris a little bit longer, you know. Uh, but he, I, but he, he said well, the next stage of the tour will cost £30. Uh, we, you know, it's a significant amount of money in those days. You know. But, well, I think that we, we, we thank you very much uh, for listening and uh, thank you very much for your questions. Um, so we, we've, we've delved into something of the, um, uh, of the 18th century and... and um, um, Halliday was al always described as a gentleman and, and, and as someone of, of, of considerable charm and considerable ability and I have no doubt he was probably a musician I would think someone with, with his attainments was probably able to play instruments and so on certainly would have enjoyed music and I'd like to hand back uh, now to Tanya for our next pieces of 18th century music
It's now my pleasure to invite the Right Reverend Chris Hudson, who not only is the minister of Second Church Belfast, now renamed All Souls Church in Elmwood Avenue, but who is also the moderator of the non-subscribing Presbyterian Church in Ireland. So I invite him up to say just a few words in closing. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Simon. Um, I'd like to first of all thank Simon and First Church for hosting this event this evening. Uh, we are really grateful to be here collected together from what we now call the four churches of Belfast, Dunmurray, All Souls, First Church and Mount Pottinger. And we have, over a period of time, thinking of ideas and that we can, events that we can do together. And of course, as soon as we heard that David had produced this book, we, we jumped at this idea. And we were delighted, all four churches, David, to be associated with this evening. And also we'd like to thank the Presbyterian Society and very Reverend Michael Barry for being here this evening and making the book possible. Because by not publishing the book, none of us will be here this evening. And it's, a, it's been a wonderful event, and I hope we have a lot more events like this. And our historians in our denomination are very important to us. And on saying that, may I note also the presence of Reverend Dr. John Nelson, one of our significant historians in the non-subscribing Presbyterian Church. And David, tonight you have given us a reintroduction to Samuel Holliday, some of us for the first time. But also you've cast light on those years, I won't call them the lost years, but the hidden years, and you've revealed them to us, which is very important. And I noted on page 23, if I just can read one line from it. For some members of the Synod, it was enough merely to be seen in the company of London non-subscribers which was why Holiday was careful to distance himself from all parties. I just love that comment and the reference to, uh, to Dunlop. And on saying that, may I also welcome my good friend, John Dunlop, who has nothing to do with the Dunlop in the book. Good to see you, John. Um, you create a very interesting picture, David, because what comes across is a personality, although one who has got his own personal doctrine, his own personal belief, finds a way to work with just about everybody in numerous different denominations. And I don't want to use the term, was he capable of reinventing himself all the time? But it did show a, a, a wonderful personality that was able to achieve this and able to bring people along. And I must say, I'm really looking forward to reading the book, and I'm really delighted, as I said, for the four churches of Belfast to be associated with this. Now, I have a very nice task as well, uh, as complimenting David on his book, to remind you that we have refreshments upstairs in the Central Hall, but also... Tyler. So I, please, I invite you all to join us upstairs. And once again, thank you, David, for this wonderful evening. Thank you.